So thank you for joining us. We're going to be talking about the Chrome developer tools and what sort of new features are, are available, um, covering everything that's kind of happened in the past six months or anything that you haven't known about, um, but good stuff. So the way that I want to get us started is introducing who we have uh, here in this Hangout. I'm Paul Irish. I'm on the Chrome Developer Relations team, and I like the Chrome Developer Tools quite a bit. Uh, we also have joining us uh, Pavel Feldman. Pavel uh, is the tech lead of Chrome Developer Tools. And uh, yeah, say hello. Hey. Cool. Um, also on the Chrome team, we have Sam Dutton coming in from London. Uh, How you doing, guys? Good to see you. Nice. And also over there, uh, Peter Beverloo. Hey. Good morning. Cool. Nice. Uh, if you haven't checked out Peter.sh, it's a great um, blog coming with uh, weekly updates on what's happening inside Chrome and WebKit and the Chrome Dev Tools in particular. So uh, that's a, a great source for what's new and breaking in Chrome Dev Tools land. Uh, we also have uh, with us Alex Sexton. Alex is Howdy. a... Uh, JavaScript and front-end developer uh, down in Austin, Texas. And, uh, and we're looking to get one more, uh, one more developer with us uh, pretty soon, Paul Lewis. We hope to see him joining us. But we'll get started now. Nice. Uh, is that Paul? Yo. Oh, great. Paul, you just, uh, we were just finishing up uh, introductions. So Paul Lewis, um, based over in you in the UK. Oh. I'm in London, yeah. In London, perfect. Um, Paul is a WebGL, CSS3, uh, 3D transforms, GPU, JavaScript hacker, making cool, fun, awesome, creative stuff. Uh, so the way that we're going to go about this, um, we have a Google moderator with a bunch of questions. Um, that you could vote up and down. That you should see that in the uh, Google Plus posts that we have. Um, you can click over there, vote up other people's questions, vote down them if you don't want to hear us cover that, um, and uh, ask anything that you want to get get an answer to. Uh, and if that sounds good, we'll get started. Um, so. In the Chrome Developer Tools, uh, I just have them open here, and uh, we're going to walk through some of the things that are, are new. One thing that I should point out is uh, we do have the ability to zoom the UI, which is really handy for this uh, use case of showing you guys. So now if you hit Command plus, Command minus, uh, it zooms the entire thing. This works out really well for projecting or, or anything else. Um, so if you haven't uh, looked at the dev tools in about six months, you might not have noticed down in the very bottom right is a little settings cog. And down here, uh, the Chrome developer tools own settings. One of the tools, uh, one of the nice things in here is the ability to override the user agent. Um, and so now we can set the user agent to be one of any of these predefined um, other browsers, or define our own user agent that we want uh, Chrome to mask as. And so this is the navigator.useragent JavaScript property, but also the user agent that goes out in the request header. So it's a kind of complete end-to-end -end UA masking solution. Um, another setting right beneath this, and this is brand new, is emulate touch events. And so if you've done mobile work before, um, you might have been frustrated with the fact that you can't do real touch events on desktop, and you always have to be using a mobile device and fire up your emulator. So now we can emulate touch events right in Chrome. So to show off this, I'm going to bring up a little demo. Let's see. So this is just a little Canvas app, and it's it uh, as you touch it, it draws. Um, inside my browser right now, I'm clicking all over. It's not doing anything. 
but if I bring up the Chrome Developer Tools and uh, and I have the Dev Tools open uh, with the settings checked, uh, all the the touch start, touch end, touch move uh, events are emulated, so I get exactly the kind of behavior that I want. Pretty nice. Good. Um, Pavel, did you want to talk a little bit about uh, the color picker that's now available? Uh, yeah, that's uh, something new that we have. Uh, it is uh, interesting because uh, it's a third party contribution, and we are happy about third parties contributing code into the Open Spectrum and Chrome DevTools. Uh, so if you try uh, to click a little color swatch, the color pickle will show up. It shows you the palette and the gradient, and uh, you can adjust transparency through this alpha channel. Uh, and uh, as you are adjusting the transparency, you will see how the background uh, is visible through the uh, color that you've chosen. So it's pretty essential. Let's see if I can. Yeah. Hey, Pavel, can you still get at the uh, selector for changing the representation right, of the color? Right, the control click will be toggling between the formats. Control click. Oh. I was wondering about that. Let's see. Uh-oh. Control click. No, control click on this watch in the list. Uh, and, okay. here. and here you can adjust this alpha slider, and you will see the background. Try adjusting this alpha slider and look at the color preview. You don't actually need to have any background. Yeah, just move this thing. Yeah, you will see a little chessboard thingy. I don't need the color yep. in the preview. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so the color picker has been a big request. Uh, for a long time, so we're very happy to have that available. So one of the things you might have also noticed uh, in this view is that um, the checkboxes are now on the left. So uh, this is this has been a big request for a long time um, of these these checkboxes to disable these styles um, have been on the right for for the longest time, um, and a lot of people have felt that makes more sense on the left. So now, if you open up Chrome Canary, they're on the left. Um, so Pavel put this in about last week, and uh, we hope you'll like that. Yeah, it was the end of a two-year struggle. <laughs> this and the single <laughs> click, right? Yeah, yeah, so single click. Um, uh, for the longest time in the, in the Chrome Developer Tools, if you want to change, for instance, uh, any of these properties, like I want to change font size from small to large, I would double click um, and it would go into this edit mode and then I could uh, change that. Um, now it's only a single click to make that change. Um, so it's a lot more malleable. It's, it's, it's very nice. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, I also any any newcomers. Um, so we're just walking through the some of the features of the Chrome Developer Tools, some of the new stuff. Um, we also we have a Google moderator, and if you want to ask any questions, um, please just vote up questions or ask any new ones over there. Sam, could you? Is there anything in the moderator that you think we should uh, tackle right now? Yeah, the sure is we've got a stack of stuff coming in on moderator. Great. Um, yeah, blimey, where to start? Okay, well, I'll start at the top. The most popular question uh, we've had so far, I think, is, well, it's a big one, um, asking if we could uh, walk through tracking down a memory leak in a page or an extension using the heap profiler. Uh, sure. So, yeah, Good go one. for it. Okay. Um. All right, so I'm going to bring up this. Pavel, feel free to interrupt me uh, as I go along with this. We have a little test page here. 
And uh, if we look at the source of the test page, um, we've got a few things going on. We have an array, and uh, we have a button. And when it's clicked, we're going to do this. Um, we're going to create a new P, and we're going to add that into the page um, and add that into our holding array. And after a little bit, we're going to remove, we're going to clear out the page's content. So what this looks like is that. Just adding it, the page is being cleared. But what you'll notice in something like Timeline is that the memory usage just continues to go up, and the garbage collection never cuts that memory usage back down. Um, and this right here is an indication that you might be encountering a uh, memory leak. So I'll try and go through how we can identify where this leak is. So we go over to profiles, and we're going to take a heap snapshot. It didn't matter, Steve, you stopped the timeline, did you? Timeline is still recording. OK, snapshot done. Perhaps there's a memory leak in the snapshot tool. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to try and go ahead and with, with the action. So if we've identified in the timeline tool that there is increasing memory usage, um, I'm now going to... Oh, we have zero bytes. We might have to try this over in Chrome Stable for the moment. Yeah, no, no, go back to the canary. You like it's, it? Uh, we, yeah, right. just try clearing it up and collecting another one. Don't do anything, just to collect the thing. Ooh, that's much better. I wonder how much you have leaked. How much what? How much uh, heap size, how, how big heap is, is it, it takes too long. So it, it should take this much time for the Gmail, not for the say hello thingy. Ouch. That was good. Yeah. Let's try one more. So I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to hit the button five times. And we're going to record another heap snapshot. And then we're going to go over to comparison mode. And it looks like, Pavel, are we seeing what we want? No. And uh, this doesn't look like uh, stable to me, is it? No, it's not stable. Yeah. No, that's a t CPU. Uh -huh. Love it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Over in stable. One, two, three, four, five. Another snapshot. Clicking over to the second snapshot and changing our mode to comparison.
Yay. That's good. Pavel. <laughs> Don't look at me. You have all of these tabs doing something to the left. Something. <laughs> something going on. Um, so what I'm used to seeing is um, capturing uh, a, a delta of five, um, associating my five clicks with five new items, um, and being able to track um, the, it's actually a paragraph element, um, paragraph element back to that holding array. Ah, uh, here we go, yep. So here we, we are basically seeing the paragraph elements that were created and their retaining path back to holding right down here. Um, so essentially um, tracking through, through the timeline tool to Okay. We're good? Nice. You're back on it. Okay, okay. <laughs> good. Um, all right, so I'm going to move, move on from memory uh, as it gets pretty fun. Um, so... Page that we had or not? Did it close it? I think I have it. Yep, I have Okay, it. so I can go real quick through the, the actual scenario. So what you do is you take a snapshot, mm -hmm. and then you do a set of actions that should result in a zero sum. So that you create something and discard something, and you, accept, and you expect no objects to be retained in the memory. And then you compare those snapshots and see the deltas. And if the delta is positive, that means that objects with corresponding classes are still in the memory. And clicking on these, um, expanding these classes and clicking on the instances will show retaining trees, uh, retaining paths, the path that, the JavaScript path that is retaining this very object. And uh, depending on the version of Chrome that you're running, if you look uh, at this list and find detached DOM nodes row in this very table, um, do you have it? Yeah, try uh, sorting by alphabetically and uh, going to the detached DOM something. It's a top level uh, entry. No, you don't have it? Okay, you are likely to have a... Try going from comparison to the, um, to the summary, just for a second. Uh, I'm bringing it up because uh, you can start with the uh, you have detached DOM nodes. Yep. Right. So there's a special row for detached DOM trees, and you, if you expect no, no DOM nodes to be detached from your tree, um, you start looking in here. And if you see some, it means that these are the DOM uh, fragments that are retained by the JavaScript, and that's pretty much the first thing you do when you find the memory, because all your DOM nodes are either on the screen or in the caches that you are aware of. And uh, Paul has uh, shown the kind of generic profiler capabilities, uh, but browser is not only JavaScript, it is also DOM, and those two are bound uh, in a sophisticated manner. So uh, to kind of uh, assess this binding and see if there are memory leaks on the um, boundary between the DOM and JavaScript, you, you look in here. Nice. Cool. So, so just to get that straight, a, a really standard process for checking for DOM leaks is take a snapshot, do something, take a snapshot again, do comparison, and then look for, what is it, detached DOM tree at that point? 
Well, in the generic case, you just look for the class names uh, for like large objects in your model. Uh, say if you are writing Gmail, you have a lot of conversation or a thread. And if you see an increase in the number of threads or conversations where you don't expect it to, you start with these large objects. If you don't have any clue on uh, on the large object of your model, you start with the DOM binding because that's uh, where the probability of the leak is, is fairly high. Thanks. Cool. So while we're looking at uh, JavaScript. I wanted to show some of the new stuff that we have for kind of navigating around the JavaScript that you have. Um, I'm going to bring up this page. <coughs> so over in the scripts panel, um, if you open it, you might see something like this. And uh, in the left hand side is the scripts navigator. Um, and by default, it's kind of in a temporal state. Um, but you can click this to, to make sure that it's always there and permanent. Um, but below, you're going to see all your active scripts on the page, um, sorted by origin and folder. Um, and anything coming in from your Chrome extensions is going to be separated out now. So it's a lot easier and cleaner to kind of see what's active. Yay! It's great, yeah. Um, another nice way to, to look through any active scripts that you have is hitting uh, Command-O. So command O will bring up uh, the go to resource little navigator, and I can type out um, any part portion of the file name um, and navigate directly into that. We also have um, I think the in, uh, our user hint. I think you can do this uh, eclipse like the camel case thingy where you only type first two letters in the camel case large name and it will match it. You don't have those because everything you have is minified. Uh, yeah, it's true. Yeah, every, all my... Most of my scripts are minified. Um, and so within a, within a script, um, so I could beautify it down here, um, and I get some sense and I can scroll around uh, I can hit Command L and go to a specific line, um, but now I can also hit Command Shift O and navigate by function name. So I can jump directly to my siblings method of jQuery um, or anything else. So having uh, this um, really easy way to jump between my folder between my function definitions. Uh, saves quite a bit of time in navigating your script and then placing breakpoints or doing your debugging. One of the things that I think is also really nice uh, when it comes to JavaScript debugging is being able to have your um, walking through your code in a, in a very large view and seeing your page. Um, and so one of the new things that you have in the Chrome DevTools is the ability to dock all of the tools to the right-hand side. So now I can check that, and now we have, uh, I'll even bring that back, yep. So now uh, I have my page, my code over on this side, um, and I can work out exactly what's going on, what the behavior is. Uh, one of the other, uh, right beneath that, is disable cache. And uh, disable cache will disable the disk cache. So Chrome is actually very aggressive when it comes to caching uh, because it likes things to be fast. Um, but sometimes as a developer, that caching works against you. So disable cache will just bypass the disk cache. Um, so you're always getting the freshest uh, resources. Um, and Pavel, this, so correct me if I'm wrong, this cache uh, affects only this current page because it's only an enabled when I have the DevTools open, right? Right. So if you have that checked, you close off DevTools, um, your, your cache is now functioning as it normally should. Um, so you have to have the Chrome DevTools open for this to take place. Uh, 
I, I wanted to interject a little bit. Uh, one thing that I do a lot in my development is uh, actually override hosts uh, and host files and, and try to do local development uh, against servers that way. So uh, I also have to clear often my uh, my DNS cache and sometimes even my socket cache. Mm. And you can get to that through the uh, like the Chrome uh, protocol net dash internals and clear it in the DNS um, there. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, going to about about, um, you can see all the the Chrome internal diagnostic pages. Um, app cache internals is a really good one, and where you can remove any existing application caches that you have. Good if you're doing offline work. Uh, but net internals is a pretty significant um, internal diagnostic page, where you can see a lot of things going on with sockets and DNS. Um, so that's a good call, Alex. Nice. Um, should we take another question from the moderator? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, let's have a look and see. I'll tell you, um, today I uh, was talking about, um, let me just find the questions here. Um, let me just find the right one, question from uh, Pat in Auckland. He, uh, the question actually we were asked today at the DevTools presentation was, uh, is there a plan, uh, well, something on the DevTools roadmap to either directly support or some other way uh, facilitate extensions which allow less SaaS debugging? Uh, so Pat's thinking of something like Fire SaaS for Firefox. Uh, says, I've heard about source mapping, but uh, from what I understand, that only applies to JS. Yeah, that is correct. And uh, we are currently not working on the last SAS support. Uh, it's a bit more than source maps for CSS, because uh, what you would like to see is uh, actually your variables, your mix ends and such on the right hand side, so that you could edit them as in the source, and they would uh, take immediate action in the browser, uh, which involves the transformation from the source to the browser terms and mapping things back. So it's a bit uh, more complex than basically mapping the uh, locations in the minified and non-minified script. More work. But uh, as you probably know, WebKit is uh, moving forward with uh, supporting uh, many of these uh, features natively. And uh, we will have no option other than supporting them in the UI. And once they are in the UI, we can think of supporting uh, the mapping, but who would need it? Yeah, so um, there's been a spec published on CSS hierarchies, um, which is like your selector hierarchy if you're using CSS or LAS. Um, also, CSS mixins, there's a spec published. Um, and so WebKit is, is very interested in, um, in, in baking that right into the platform as well. Um, but since we brought up source maps, um, I was going to show that. Cool. This is source maps. And the best way to, to, to demonstrate what they do uh, is with this little demo. So I have a small little app um, with colors. And as I click the colors, we're just changing the background, right? This is easy enough. If I view the source of this app, um, looks down at the bottom like I commented out my original source files and I'm just including my compile.js, which is a bunch of minified JavaScript. So this happens a lot and you're in a situation where um, you are looking in the scripts and you open up compile.js and it's minified and you want to debug what's going on. Now I can beautify it, um, but I still have, you know, short variable names, uh, so that's not working out too well. S but source maps give us uh, a lot of power here. So if you notice down at the bottom of this file is a reference to a source map.json. Um, now if I bring that up, so it is, I think it's in that JS folder. Cool. 
so this is just a JSON file which maps the identifiers of the minified script back to the original script. Um, and it's also referencing the original source files. So what this allows me to do is instead of seeing this compiled JavaScript here in the DevTools, if I open up my settings and enable source maps, I'm going to refresh the page. And now, instead of seeing compiled.js, I see script and setup and my original jQuery um, unminified. So here I'm mapping my minified JavaScript directly back to my original files. Um, and I can set breakpoints in this um, and have it work exactly like you want. So this is the kind of like base uh, way of looking at the feature of I can take um, compiled JavaScript and map that back to my original source files, um, however many there may be. Um, but source maps empower a lot more than that. For instance, CoffeeScript, um, being able to map your compiled JavaScript back to your CoffeeScript so that you can actually debug CoffeeScript right here in Chrome DevTools. Um, Source Maps enables this, and there's a few patches waiting on the CoffeeScript project to accept. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to see uh, real debugging inside the DevTools of CoffeeScript coming soon. Uh, does does uh, Google Clojure Advanced Compilation support uh, Source Maps yet? Or I know it's intending to. Uh, as far as I know, yes. Um, so the call, um, I don't think I have this available too much. So we've been working together with them on the format, and they are supposed to uh, output this format. Uh, it's V3, yeah, so uh, yep. that's the one we support in the attachments. Cool, yep. that's good. And if you can read this, uh, this is kind of how it works with the compiler. So I, I, yeah, so using Clojure Compiler, uh, we run it, we specify our original source files, we say that we want to create a source map, and we're going to use V3, and then we're going to output it. And so um, this will generate uh, the source maps and, and get you off uh, looking in a good path. Cool. Um, DOM undo and redo. Pavel, you added this recently. Do you want to walk us through how this works? Yeah, we should all uh, give it a try and uh, put some stress in it to see if it is crash or not, because uh, it is a fairly complex thing. So the, the way it works is uh, DOM actions, uh, editing attributes, removing nodes, uh, editing as HTML are all uh, undoable, as well as editing CSS properties are and adding new rules and modifying selectors. Pretty much everything you can see in the elements panel should be undoable and redoable. And uh, when it does so, it preserves uh, the DOM node instances. So it's not simply installing an old markup or a new markup and loses all the pages state, but it is doing it in a sophisticated manner so that all the references to your nodes from JavaScript will still uh, basically be valid. And the other addition to that is that edit as HTML is now uh, super smart. Uh, when you are editing, you can edit the entire body of your page. And it will only patch the nodes that have changed, preserving identities uh, of the other ones. So we can I don't know, open Gmail and edit something uh, in the body and commit the edit. And all the threads are still going to be alive. And uh, it's all undoable and redoable. Right, so if you have, you know, event handlers bound to, to, to part of your nodes, um, you can still come up and edit this entire body as HTML, uh, make your changes, and your DOM nodes are all still fine. Uh, so pretty sophisticated stuff going over, uh, going under the hood there. Uh, a very powerful feature. Um, but what this manifest says um, in an easy way, so let's say... Um, I just want to test some things out, and you know, I, I want to see what this looks like without the, the H1. I can delete, um, and that works fine, but 
maybe I want to bring it back. Just hit undo, like Command-Z, um, and bring it back. Or uh, Command-Shift-Z to redo that. So any any changes that you make here, Command-Z to, to bring back the original state. And uh, you can also hit F2 to start editing as HTML, because uh, we now feel that it is safer, because it preserves the states uh, of the elements. Mm -hmm. And we expect users to be using it more often because it's super flexible. Yeah. Um, OK, one request. Anyone watching, um, if you could just hit a plus one on the post so we get an idea of how many people are out there. Um, we'd love that. And Sam, could you introduce another question from the moderator? Yes, indeed. We've got one from uh, Tony. He says he's from Cactus Land, uh, also known as Arizona, I think. Um, he's asking if there are any plans for the console to support autocomplete of elements in the current page. So he's thinking, thinking of things like uh, an element that has an ID of, oh my god, I don't want to type this. Uh, and he wants to attach, say, a method via jQuery. Uh, he's wondering if he could do something like uh, dollar parenthesis quote hash omg and then it auto completes. So it sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, let's see. Ah, uh, so he basically wants auto complete uh, based on the IDs and classes that are already active in the DOM. Um, and have that available in the console? That's right, yeah. I think that's what he's after. So whatever, I guess, is within scope, so to speak, in terms of ID or class, I guess. Yeah. Um, so right now we have... Um, uh, we do have the ability to autocomplete anything in the console... Um, when it's already available in the DOM. So any of you, the functions that you have defined in the page. Um, I, I love this a lot just to like get a reminder of what's available on window.location. Um, and I forget the names of these properties all the time. Um, one trick that you could do, so let's say that uh, document.body um, had an ID of uh, my awesome body. Um, where it's a window dot document all. <laughs> this is a terrible idea. I'm not suggesting this at all. Uh, it looks like that we won't get completion there. That's a, so. Anyways, I think nice try. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good idea, um, but right now we don't have any uh, capabilities of, of bringing in um, your elements and auto-completing your selectors. Uh, but, w but we totally should, so filing a bug is yeah. what should happen. They, they um, are not being auto-completed for Pavel, do you want to... The, the IDs are not being auto-completed for performance reasons right now. Um, basically, trying to find an element by its ID name instead of an actual variable is quite slow for the rendering engine for WebKit. Mm. Um, yeah, actually, I'm going to go grab uh, my USB cable because I have something to show. Pavel, do you want to run through um, just the right way to file a, a bug or a feature request? Uh. Can I steal control or you can over your machine or how do you do that? Um, you can you can screen share uh, on your side. Can I go see it? Yep. So I'm opening a magic link that it that is called WebKit Org New Inspector Bug. Okay, come on. I need another browser. 
Wait a moment. So you need to be logged in. Uh, so we have, you need to register at WebKids Pixilla. And um, let me do it again with another browser. Moment. Just a quick um, uh, re reminder for anyone who's uh, hanging out watching this. Um, you can uh, view the different uh, uh, screens by clicking on them. So if you want to see uh, Pavel's screen or someone else's, you can click on that individual hangout uh, window down the bottom there. OK. So is that better? Can you see it now? So that's the page uh, the new inspector Bob brought me to. So uh, what I'm typing is web inspector. Uh, autocomplete. Oh, it Already wants to automate something. Autocomplete uh, DOM node IDs and classes uh, in the console. Uh, then you describe what you want. Like um, you have a document uh, body ID is foo, and you press uh, F O, F O, and tab in your console, and uh, you expect to expand to full. Um, and then you just submit this bug, and it goes straight into my inbox. And uh, the reason I am uh, suggesting to share it, uh, to submit it into WebKit, because uh, whenever something is happening within the uh, DevTools window, 95% um, of what is there is being developed in the WebKit repository. Uh, by our team. So uh, what you do is uh, you can either file a bug against Chromium, which will totally work, or if you're confident it's uh, part of the Chrome DevTools window, you just uh, go ahead and submit it into the uh, WebKit. So that's pretty much it. Nice. Thank you. Uh, um, I did want to show uh, a somewhat new feature that a lot of people haven't seen. Um, and we're going to uh, bring up some help for this. Um, so just while you're doing that, can I take another question from moderator? Yeah, please do. Um, yeah, it's one that people have asked. Another question from uh, Pat in New Zealand. Uh, he's asking if there's a way to uh, persist the break on subtree attributes modification breakpoint functionality through multiple page refreshes. So. Uh, you know, trying to debug some code at page load, but currently if you refresh the page, it resets them. So, yeah. So it's a, it is a totally a bug. It should preserve those. Uh, there's a little uh, hint though. Uh, what, what the tool is doing upon page load, upon the onload event, it will try to restore all the breakpoints based on the node uh, IDs. And, uh, uh, if um, if your DOM is dynamic, or if uh, something is uh, not yet has not yet happened, and the DOM is not there in the uh, and the node is, is not in the DOM, uh, the tool will fail to do that. But it will uh, pick it up once the node is there. If does not if this scenario does not work for you, file a bug. Otherwise, it should be just fine. Thanks, Paul. That's great. So uh, I wanted to show a really nice feature that we just enabled. Um, and that is remote debugging. If you haven't known, uh, we shipped Chrome for Android uh, a little bit ago. And one of the great things that we have available is that you can actually uh, have the full power of the Chrome developer tools, um, the sorts of things that you've been seeing today, available for your mobile device. Uh, so I'm just going to show how this works. Um, I have my, my phone plugged in. I also enabled uh, USB debugging inside the OS. Um, and I'm going to just set up an ADB port forward. Great. Um, and now we're going to bring up localhost port 9222. Cool. So, uh, just to kind of capture this. 
So the uh, six lists, uh, six items up there, refer to my six open tabs right here. Um, so I'm going to just go back to Google News and click it up here. And so um, if you didn't know, the Chrome Developer Tools is a web app. So I'm just running the Chrome Developer Tools as a web app inside Chrome, right? Um, but this is the actual inspector of the page. Uh, to, to show that, I'm just going to hover over these sections. Um, and you should be seeing the nice hover happen inside the, the phone's UI. So um, yeah, this is, is, is pretty powerful. I'm going to go over to console just to prove that uh, we got this going on. One. Yeah, nice. So full remote debugging capability. Um, things like uh, your network timing, um, the ability to, to run heat profiles um, and get memory debugging info on a phone is something that we haven't had available before. Um, and so uh, now with Chrome on Android, um, we have that full capability and we're really excited about what that uh, offers to mobile development. You need an ice cream sandwich phone, but you should uh, not get one anyway. Peter, is there anything you want to add on that? True, yeah, ice cream sandwich required. Um, Delicious, too. Yeah, ice cream sandwich is required. And last Saturday, we actually pushed a new beta of uh, Chrome and Android. Um, and of course, there's much more awesome upcoming. Nice. So get excited. Good stuff coming. Um, OK, I think uh, we could talk about Extensions, selector profiling, show paint recs, um, anything, Pavel, that you, you think we should point out? So I could see keywords uh, on what we are currently doing. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. To what, yeah, so Paul has mentioned the paint recs, and uh, um, the, um, let me list what we are currently uh, committed to doing and are in progress of. So we are uh, paying a lot of attention to mobile. Um, we are happy to see a remote debugging story, but uh, you often want to uh, be able to hack your uh, mobile web page from a desktop uh, browser. So what we are currently working on is a more sophisticated user agent emulation that would allow uh, emulating screen resolution, uh, more events, more uh, native events that would uh, make sense for the mobile device um, so that you could basically conveniently continue developing for mobile. Uh, we are currently working on uh, memory a lot. So the heat profiler that is not working on a canary is not working because we are redoing the entire thing. Uh, we want it to be simpler. We want it to support uh, scenarios for memory counting or uh, generic um, heat information capabilities and such. So uh, going full speed there. We are also working on the HTML5 features, such as IndexedDB, has been recently landed. Uh, is still within the experimental, but uh, has good chances of uh, going public uh, in Chrome 19. Um, we are also focusing on the um, game development stories. And we are reworking our timeline uh, for better capturing what frame is, uh, what 16 milliseconds for frame mean, and uh, what actually takes time uh, so that uh, our clients would have way better clue on what needs to be optimized, whether it's paint, layout, or JavaScript, or garbage collection, or something. Yeah. And um, what else? Um, that's, that's pretty much it. And, uh, and yes, we are exploring uh, different persistence stories uh, Paul, oh, do you want to mention a couple of uh, extensions for persistence? Yeah, I would love to. Um, so if you've, if you've been editing your styles, um, as you've, you might have seen, there is an ability to uh, bring this back up. Uh, 
to get a diff of your changes um, and save your the new file back to disk. Um, but a lot of people have been curious as if that 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 little path that workflow could be made automatic. Um, so there's been a, 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 a little bit of work in that direction recently. Um, there's two extensions that I would uh, ask you to, to check out. One of them, you can get a, a brief view if you just Google for Adi Osmani autosave DevTools. Um, and Adi's put out a nice little screencast about how this works. But essentially, it's a, an extra Chrome extension. Um, you make your changes. You run a node server. And it just saves the changes that you're making into the DevTools back to your disk as you go. Um, there's another extension made by um, a member of the DevTools engineering team um, that has uh, similar functionality, just you know, kind of a different UI. And uh, right now, they're talking about how to kind of merge these two efforts. But um, if you want that kind of functionality, definitely check out one of those two projects. That's great to see, actually. That covers, uh, yeah, questions where you get regular events and one that's uh, high up the list on moderator. Um, just a reminder to people who are watching this, if they could uh, plus one the, uh, the page for this, because uh, it, it really helps us work out what, what kinds of uh, Hangouts people want. And uh, yeah, so plus one it if you could. That'd be great. Yep. There's uh, a lot happening in DevTools. Um, I just loaded up Canary using a command line flag, enable DevTools experiments. Um, inside settings that enables some extra stuff going on um, as in index DV, which Pablo was talking about, being able to see Shadow DOM inside Elements panel, um, some extra stuff. So uh, if you want to ride the bleeding edge, uh, that's where it's at. You can check out peter.sh um, for kind of the news on a week-by-week -week basis of the entire Chrome and WebKit projects. but. Uh, you'll get a lot of detail on what's happening inside the DevTools as well. Um, and I would also recommend um, Canary updates once a day about, um, and you can run it side by side with another Chrome instance. So I really recommend running Canary and Chrome Stable side by side. Uh, in Canary, you get the freshest DevTools features, um, but you get to hold on to Stable to see what all your, your, your users are seeing your site and app at. Uh, um, so, I think that's it. Um, anyone else have anything they want to add? No? Cool. Well, uh, Thanks, I thank guys. you to my guests um, for joining me, and um, we appreciate you guys uh, coming and hanging out with us. So, thanks.